So hello. hello, welcome. My name is Darren Poley. I'm the outreach librarian here at Falvey Library. And on behalf of Joe Lucia, the director of the library, who couldn't be here today, and the rest of the staff, I want to say welcome again to all of you for coming to today's talk. I will do a brief introduction and then turn the stage over to Dr. Caverly, who probably doesn't need much of an introduction, but I'll say a couple of things. We're especially glad to have someone from the College of Engineering. And this is actually the final uh, talk that we have as a part of the Scholarship of Illinois series that the library sponsors in this semester. So uh, next semester we're also glad to have uh, one of your colleagues from the College of Engineering to speak as a part of that series and of course we have lots of other programming going on in the library uh, so we're glad that you're here to participate. Uh, I would also like to say, mention to you something that uh, just sort of uh, as an aside, the community bibliography, which the library is actively working on and will not unveil until the spring, is something that uh, we're hoping to build out in the meantime. And so when we have a speaker come, we also ask that he send us a list, uh, he or she, a list of all of their publications so we can include that in our community bibliography that we're building, which is an institutional bibliographic database. Uh, Professor Robert H. Caverly received his BSEE and his MSEE degrees from North Carolina State University, Raleigh, and his PhD degree in electrical engineering from the Johns Hopkins University, Baltimore, Maryland. Dr. Caverly has been a faculty member at Villanova University in the Department of Electrical and Com Computer Engineering since 1997 and is now a full professor. Previously, he was employed for more than 14 years at the University of Massachusetts Dartmouth formerly Southeastern Massachusetts University. In 1990, with support from the National Science Foundation, he was a visiting research fellow with the Microwave Solid State Group at the University of Leeds in the United Kingdom. Dr. Caverly's research interests, funded by several government agencies and private in industry, are focused on characterizing semiconductor devices such as pin diodes and FETs in the microwave and RF control environment. Besides microwave semiconductor electronics, his other interests include analog and digital CMOS VLSI design, an area where he has taught a, a number of workshops both in this country and abroad, as well as graduate and undergraduate courses here at Villanova University. He is a senior member of the IEEE and he has published more than 60 journal and conference papers and the, of course the book that we're here to talk about today published by Artec House in 2007 CMOS RFIC Design Principles and I should mention I identified radio frequency in the title but other than that uh, I didn't get the rest so I guess I understand a quarter of what he's going to say I maybe um, but I give you Dr. Robert H. Caverly. Thank, Thank you very much Hopefully by the end of the talk, you'll understand at least 100% of the abbreviations in the, uh, in the title. And uh, so I want to thank the library for uh, giving me this opportunity. And I want to thank my family and colleagues and students and, and uh, other members of the university community uh, for being here. So let me talk a little bit about what the first eight letters of the book actually means. And before I do that, though, there's a couple of acknowledgments I want to make. Uh, first is that this work was partially based upon a combined research and curriculum development grant that I received in 2002 from the National Science Foundation, of which a couple of other uh, ECE faculty were actually a part of. Um, and some of the work that I had done on my portion of the grant was uh, uh, made its way into this, uh, into this book. Uh, of course, our tech house of Norwood, Massachusetts, uh, who uh, published the book, and our tech house is a uh, publishing company that deals pretty much in the microwave and the RF electronics community. And then finally, the library here at uh, 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 Villanova, because uh, I did this while I was on my sabbatical, and I was not on campus, but I accessed a lot of the library materials from off campus, which was and practically on a daily basis. And uh, as a matter of fact, that's what actually precipitated this beginning of this talk because I sent a letter to the library director, Dr. Lucia, and he said, okay, very nice. Would you like to give a book talk? So that's, uh, that's what happened. Um, just to sort of start things off, 
many of you may recognize from your childhood or from archives if you're a student uh, the comic strip on the left which was a uh, policeman and you would read in the Saturday morning or Sunday morning comics and he had this thing called a two-way wrist radio okay uh, this was the 50s and 60s and you know I I looked at that and thought gee that was really neat he could have this little radio on his wrist and he could talk to talk into it and talk back to uh, police headquarters and so forth and that was my first introduction to the concept of wireless connectivity was the two-way wrist radio which actually I found out that Chester Gould came up with this idea after a visit with uh, uh, A.J. Gross, who was actually the inventor of the walkie-talkie. So uh, that was my first introduction. Then, of course, science fiction uh, through the 60s and 70s. Say, for example, Star Trek, where the tricorder, if you recall from that series, this was some sort of computer device that used wireless sensing, and it would communicate with the Enterprise. And so the concept of wireless connectivity came through in science fiction. And of course, there's the bad side of the wireless connectivity. There was the, uh, the sort of evil Borg who were connected through some sort of wireless scheme. Um, so I like the picture of the, this, the Borg in this particular one for the following reason. And that's because if we think about the science fiction of the 60s, 50s, 70s, a lot of that science fiction is now fact because if you look at it under wireless connectivity we now have little Bluetooth transceivers that fit in the ear not unlike fitting in the ear of our science fiction activities we have wireless LANs, we have PDAs, we have Blackberries for good or bad uh, you just can't seem to get anywhere without wireless connectivity uh, uh, at being, being accessed so that's what sort of got me into the uh, wireless connectivity, looking at how this is done. Now, one of the things that happens with, or the, the blending between the fiction, science fiction of the past and the fact of today, is they really all have something in common. And that was the two initials that you recognized that we had in common. And that is something called RF, OK? which stands for radio frequency. And so two of the eight initials of the first part of the book title have to do with radio frequency. Okay, so that's the wireless connectivity part, the radio frequency part. CMOS RFIC design principles. Now, what about the other abbreviations? CMOS and IC. So we've only got 25% of the 100%. Where do those come from? What do those have to do with anything. Well, if we go think about all the Pentium processors or Itanium processors or any computer processors such as come out of Intel, one of the things that is common to all of those processors is the fact that they use something called CMOS technology as the process, the fabrication process to develop these processors. Now what I've shown here on this picture is a, a wafer about eight inches across with a number of these, in this case, titanium processors fabricated using this CMOS technology. The CMOS stands for complementary metal oxide semiconductor and it basically describes the process that is used in the fabrication of these devices. So in this case, with this 8-inch wafer, there's about 8 of these across the diameter, so that means these are all about an inch in size. These titaniums contain 250 million transistors, all right, all on that 1 inch on a side piece of silicon that is sometimes referred to as an integrated circuit, or IC. So there's the other eight uh, the other six out of the eight abbreviations. We've got CMOS, which describes the process technology in term that was first done and has continued to be done with an, ex an extensive amount in the silicon digital technology. We have the RF part, the radio frequency part, the part that we're used to seeing with connectivity with our PDAs and cell phones and so forth, and then the integrated circuit. So what this really means is I'm looking at a way to use the digital process technology 
to take RF functionality and put it on an IC. So that is the CMOS RFIC, and I hope you understand the design principles part. Now, as I said, what the Itanium processor like this is, this is a purely digital technology. The RF part is not. Anything having to do with your wireless LANs or anything like that is typically done with a separate chip, a separate RF chip, not on board the processor. But the intent of an RFIC design is to get to the point where we can have a single chip radio, like Dick Tracy's two-way risk radio, extremely small, that provides all of the functionality for RF in terms of receiving and transmitting the information, as well as all the digital material, all the digital processing that we've come to expect with all of our uh, various tools. Now, this is an old cell phone. Matter of fact, it's an old flip cell phone. A lot bigger than the ones, but I didn't want to take my current cell phone and rip it apart like this. But if you look, and you can see, this cell phone is actually broken up. There's a little gold boundary here around each of these sections. Now, in this cell phone, and this is, pre this, I think, I'm not even sure this cell phone can even do text messaging. That's how, uh, that's how old it is. But it had some rudimentary digital electronics for decoding the button presses and for, for showing this, the number that you're dialing or the number that is called. But it also has an RF section. This is the radio frequency section. And it has, as you can see, it's about three or four inches on a, uh, two or three inches uh, in, uh, on a square. And there's a number of discrete components. What would be nice is to have the digital and all of this on a single chip for all the processing, all the transmission, all the reception. So that's the ultimate goal of this CMOS RFIC is to have a single chip radio, everything being done on a single piece of silicon. Now, here are some of the, here's the environment that this RFIC, this single chip radio that hopefully we can, we can have with our two-way wrist radio someday. This is the environment that this is working in. What I've shown is essentially the free, what's called the frequency allocation of the, the, all the radio frequencies that are available for use. For example, many of you probably listen to KYW to find out what the traffic was like on the way in this morning. In this frequency allocation chart, KYW is right about here. Okay, So a little sliver of that frequency allocation here is for KYW. Some of these are for the various TV channels. Okay, But as you can see, it looks kind of like a quilt. All these different colors, all these different uh, channels, if you will, are uh, in this total frequency spectrum. There's the AM band, there's the FM band, so WXVU, the university radio station, is floating around somewhere in there. Okay. We also have the band here, which is where most of our cell phones operate in. And what I want to do is I want to expand this a little bit to give you an idea of what the single chip radio is up against and how the RFIC design comes into play. If I expand that a little bit, this band here, this very narrow band here, is where your GPS operates. Or your, uh, was it Tom, Tom Tom? Is that what that, yeah, the Tom Tom. It operates in that little frequency band right there. But notice, something else is there too, so it's a shared band. Here is our uh, cell phone band, and actually, actually two cell phone bands. Again, notice multiple users in the same band. So not only are we having this to transmit your information wirelessly, you're transmitting it in an environment where some other people are using it too. Okay. Now, there's a whole, what I call an alphabet soup, and I'm not going to quiz you at the end of this talk on what any of these mean. But these are some of the abbreviations for all of these specifications 
that a designer of a single chip radio has to deal with. Uh, some of you may recognize AM and FM, of course, from, from KYW being AM, WXVU being FM. If you have AT&T, GSM is the type of uh, protocol that is used there. Uh, Verizon, I believe, CDMA. So there's a whole bunch of this alphabet soup out there, but the nice thing about the RFIC, the single chip radio, putting the RF and the digital electronics together, is if we can take those RF signals and then convert them into the digital signals, then all you need to do is change the software that is the digital part, and you essentially had a radio that can take care of all of these uh, in, a, in, a, in a smart fashion. And that's the idea behind what is called a software-defined radio, or sometimes cognitive radio, smart radio. But in all cases, we've got to figure out how to get the RF signals transmitted, received, and converted so that the software, the digital processing, can, can do its magic. And that's the RFIC. Now, the book deals with how to, or at least deals with some of the principles involved with designing in an environment that's mostly used for digital electronics, how to do the design with radio frequencies involved. And the book is nine chapters, 430 pages, and it includes some CDs, or it includes a CD with some software and examples on it. I'm going to go through a very rough description of those nine chapters and also what, why there is software on, on this uh, CD. Now, I talked about that alphabet soup, that very crowded spectrum with the patchwork of, of, uh, of different protocols, different people wanted to communicate with different, uh, via different ways. And the first chapter of the book looks at that from a very high level. How do you communicate, and what are some of the specifications that all of these communications protocols have to deal with? Now, I like to look at that and describe that in a way that's not unlike some of the things that we see in everyday life. So for example, if there's just two people in a restaurant and you're talking, you can use your inside voice. You can just talk very quietly. There's not a lot of background noise. Everything is fine. The trans you, you have very good re re transmission and reception, low noise environment. On the other hand, if you're at a concert where it's the, the noise is at about the level of, well, very high level, you may have to scream, yell, so you've got a very high noise environment, or you have an environment at, a, say, a party where there's a number of conversations going on. If there's a party that has uh, international uh, attendees, you have different languages going on. And if you think about it, that's not exactly unlike what's going on in the RF environment. A lot of people talking in the same area. And so the things we look at in this communication link overview is, instead of speaking louder, we talk about what is the power that our RFIC needs to overcome certain noise that happens or certain interference that occurs, which is not unlike somebody carrying on a very loud conversation next to you when you're trying to listen to somebody on the other side. We look at that from an RF perspective, but low noise versus high noise, low interference versus high interference environment, there's a lot of similarities between the two. So that's the first chapter in the book where we go through some of those principles. The next eight chapters are spent looking at the building blocks of the radio frequency RF's uh, part of one of these single chip radios. Now this is also not going to be on a quiz, but there is a uh, sort of a general block diagram for, in this case, a GSM system, which is what you have uh, with an AT&T, and the other, say, cell phones have similar uh, block diagrams, but it's kind of interesting to note if I look at the cell phone here, Notice it has various blocks associated with it, various little components. Each one of those various little components might correspond to one of those little blocks in this block diagram. That would be the radio frequency part 
of the cell phone or the single chip radio. And at this point right here where you have the little yellow boxes, that's where the conversion to digital occurs and then we let the folks in digital processing talk about that. And the numbers that I just put up on the screen are basically what chapter of the book deals with that particular uh, block. Uh, the first, excuse me, the second and third chapter, the second chapter of the book is a review on some of the fundamentals of the transistors that make up the uh, CMOS process. Chapter three is a look at some of the passive elements that are in a uh, RFIC. And then four, five, six, seven, eight, and nine look into how do we take those transistors and those little passive elements and combine them in different ways to provide all the pieces, all the functionality, doing this on a single chip, not in a chip set, not in 25 different pieces, and not even having all of this on one chip and all the digital on the other, but having it all on one chip. Now, that's, that's a pretty tough order. Uh, and to do that, we use computers and computer-aided design to do the, well, the computers to do the design and computer-aided design to aid in the design and test of the uh, RFIC. Now, this is a particular uh, computer-aided design layout of an RFIC that, we have fa uh, that we've had fabricated and tested it uh, in the laboratory here at Villanova University. And this is the fabricated version of that through a microscope. And as you can see, if you look very carefully, you can see almost exact similarities between what's on the CAD layout and what's on the actual fabricated version. So there is a one-to-one -one correspondence. Okay. Now, why do we want to use CAD? Well, it's not easily seen in this version of why we need CAD. But if you look at the reason why, there's a penny and there's the RFIC. Okay? So you're looking at, at a piece of silicon that is a millimeter or two on a side. And that all of that functionality that I'm talking about occurs on a millimeter or two on a side or smaller. Okay? So how do we do that? Well, there's our little two millimeter RFIC. And the nice thing about CAD is we can use the computer to help us zoom in on a various parts of this IC so that we can actually then build it, modify it, or uh, maybe te make test points, a variety of different possibilities. So here is that two millimeter on a side CAD version, which remember uh, correlated exactly with the fabricated version. And I've just taken a couple of shots to show there's the zoomed in of that lower left hand corner. Now I'm going to zoom in on this piece and then I'm going to zoom in on the piece squared and that square. So you can see through CAD we can drill into smaller and smaller and smaller geometries for the IC. Now in this particular chip that dimension is about four one thousandths of an inch and this is a large transistor about a thousand times, no, 2,700 times larger than the smallest transistor you can make. And this is four one thousandths of an inch. And to give you an idea, that's the diameter of a human hair. Okay? So we're looking at very small devices. And remember, this one, I said, is 2,700 times larger than the smallest it could actually be. So obviously, we need CAD and the computer to help us deal with those such, those such small dimensions. Now. Not only does it look colorful, the colors actually have some meaning. And in the, the colors associated with this CAD layout have to do with various processing and have to do with various parts of the uh, transistor itself. For example, anytime you see blue here, or as a matter of fact, in any of the other pictures in this CAD layout, anytime you see blue, you're looking at metal. So, so you've got little teeny tiny metal wires, if you will. This whole thing is the diameter of a human hair. Just imagine what the diameter or the, uh, the width of that line is in terms of metal. 
Okay? Very, very small. The transistor itself is composed of these red, this red section and this green section, and I'm going to expand that even more. Okay. So here we've got a transistor, and this is where the design principles come in. Remember, we've got six chapters devoted to the different functionality, the different functional blocks. Each one of those functional blocks are made up of a number of transistors. Each transistor is made up of a particular t functionality that has a certain length to width ratio, a certain W and L ratio. That is prime, that's one of the major design criteria is what is the ratio of that W to that L. And in, with that and armed with a few other pieces of information, you build from that transistor up to the entire circuit. Now, in terms of a circuit schematic, this is the schematic for one of these transistors. And you can sort of see a resemblance of the transistor to the actual layout. This red piece corresponds to this component of the transistor. This green piece and this green piece talk to, or correspond to other parts of the transistor. And so we build, or at least on paper, try to determine what these W and L values are for a particular transistor and then take those individual transistors and build bigger circuits with those individual transistors <laughs> with certain connections between the two. All right, this has not 18? Yeah, this has 18 different transistors to do a very simple function, okay? Each one of these transistors has a specific W over L. How did we know what to do? Chapter six through, no, chapters three through nine tell us what the, or give us ideas about how W and L are determined. So, we've used computers to do layout and to determine how to take the, the, uh, the transistors and the layout, how to put it all together. You see there's one of those little transistors right there. Put it all together to do a, for a circuit to do a certain functionality. This actually might just be one of those blocks out of that whole diagram. We then use a computer to simulate the results. And these are just you know, pictures of different types of simulations. The reason we do the simulation, well, there are several reasons why we want to do the simulation of the circuit, because in my view, what's one of the most critical steps involved? One is you check on the proper operation. If you do the simulation and the simulation works and has the same specifications as your design, then you're done. Students like this part because they can put, do the design, do the simulation, and if it agrees, it gives you the right answer, the feedback's there. If it's not working, they get the feedback to know something's got to happen, they have to go back, check it out, and then redo it. So that's, that's very useful. It's a non-destructive way. In other words, it passes the smoke test. In the old days, if you built an electronic circuit and something was hooked up wrong, wrong it would have literally smoke. So the computer simulations give you a non-destructive way of testing operation. You get the quick feedback and fabrication dollars. That is a very compelling reason from an industrial perspective to do this. Because to make one of these ICs, you don't typically make them one at a time. You make them in a very large batch. A batch run for a single, well, for a single integrated circuit where you have many on a wafer might be a million dollars, okay, to do a single fabrication run. And I wouldn't want to go to a boss saying, gee, I forgot to make this connection. Can I have another million dollars, please? Okay. So if you go through the simulations, at least you have a, a better understanding of if that's going to work before you commit the time, the resources, and the fabrication cost to deal with one of these, the fabrication of one of these integrated circuits. Now, you might say, gee, there's a there's million dollars for one of these fabrication runs. Why are my Pentium processors so cheap? Well, for that million dollars, you may make a million processors, or you may make two million processors, and so that makes each processor worth 50 cents. Okay? So it's an economy of scale. And of course, if you can do the CAD, and if the CAD shows that it's a pretty good chance it's going to work, from a marketing perspective, you can get your 
uh, product out. One other interesting fact is I said we want to put the RF part and integrate it with the digital part to get the single chip radio. But there's a problem, and they don't live well together, it turns out. The RF parts of an IC and the digital parts of one of these single chip radios have a tendency to not talk well with each other because they are actually two, sep two completely separate uh, electronics types and noise from one tends to get into the other. And so one of the things we talk about in this book, in the design process, is how to decouple, if you will, the RF part from the digital. And we talk about ways such as putting guard, what are called guard rings around the RF part. As a matter of fact, one interesting way is to take those metal strips that you saw on the IC uh, CAD layout and actually drop them vertically so you create like this little cage around the RF part of metal. Okay, So there are some ways to do that, uh, but we have to talk, we talk about that, ways to isolate the RF part from the rest of the digital circuitry. That kind of happens already in of operation because just of the physical distance and there's a few other uh, electronic means to do that. Okay. So I hope I've given you a little bit of an appreciation for what uh, CMOS, RFIC, means and some of the design principles and what some of uh, uh, industry and our students that I'm using this in my class have to deal with. I want to talk a little bit now about um, sort of the development of the book. And for this part of the talk, I want to subtitle it as what I did on my sabbatical. Because <laughs> that's what I did on my sabbatical was I wrote this book. Uh, this was the sort of the time frame for it. Uh, I'd been talking about doing a, bo a book or a workbook for several months prior to my sabbatical. And uh, finally, my wife said, why don't you just write a book? Not a workbook, just a, just a book. And I said, OK. So <laughs> I uh, was at a conference in January. I went to the Artec House booth and met with their acquisitions editor. And he, uh, he's, he seemed interested. So. Uh, from mid-January to mid-February, I put together a book proposal with a sap sample chapter. Part of that book proposal was a table, was a required table of contents that was six pages long. Okay, and each chapter went to for it's like an introduction, subheading, sub subheading, sub sub subheading. Okay, so it had six pages of table of contents. And the reason I did that was from a piece of advice another one of their authors gave me. Because he said, if you come up with a detailed outline like this, in terms of writing, you then just fill in the blanks. <laughs> that's, that's how he put it. And it turned out to be an excellent piece of advice. Because with that kind of detailed outline, it was literally fill in the blanks, work through each chapter piece by piece. Uh, the end of February, I think it was a two or three uh, week review, and then a contract uh, came to the house, which I uh, signed immediately and turned uh, and sent back. And ba this was basically it was March 1st, and so from March 1st to 2000 or to September was basically writing. And as each chapter was completed, it went to external review. There was a uh, another technical reviewer. They came back with comments periodically. And I did some of those comments during this March to September. So this was basically the sabbatical, January to September 2006. And during this time was the proposal, the sample chapter, and all but the last chapter were done. Uh, then last fall, I got permission from the publisher to provide a Xerox copy, or to get a Xerox copy put together in the bookstore, sold it to a graduate class that I taught. And so the pre-production book, if you will, was used in a graduate course last fall. In the meantime, I was writing chapter nine. Uh, interesting thing here is I gave the students points for finding mistakes. <laughs> and, uh, well, it's interesting you said that. Somebody suggested, why don't you give them a dollar, and I didn't want to go broke. And it's a good <laughs> thing I didn't, because they found a lot of mistakes, OK? Uh, but they were very good, and I gave, I, uh, 
the one student, one particular student found like 35 or 40 errors. Uh, I didn't give them a one-to-one, -one, one point for one error. It was like one point for three errors. Uh, this particular student didn't need the help. This particular student was very good, so they didn't need the help. But they, they did find probably 50 or 60 errors, or I didn't understand this passage. Could you please, you know, or just a mistake in an equation. And I gave the points because if they went through the equations and found an actual mistake in the equation, I felt like they knew what they were doing enough to get some points out of it. And during the fall semester, revise, 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 revise. And then it went to the publisher the day after Christmas. Uh, it went through the, uh, the production process. And then about mid-February of this year, I got the first draft. I had to go through that, make sure equations, passages were correct, and so forth. Went back late March of this year. The second round of proofs came. I went through those and then uh, sent those back like a week or two later. I had to develop the index myself. And then uh, in May, I think it was May 30th, is when it hit the, uh, sort of hit the streets, just in time for the microwave conference. And I got to go to the microwave conference in June and sort of see my book on, on sale at, the, uh, uh, at their booth. So all started with the two-way wrist radio of Dick Tracy.